Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at what do you mean by relational therapy or what is relational therapy? What a good question. And, I, I, and as you said that, I, I heard a voice in my head saying, well, isn't all psychotherapy relational? And I was thinking, yeah, I'm 72. and I, I trained in 1985. And I'm sure many of my contemporary colleagues will say, well, isn't no yeah. therapy relational? I mean, you know, yeah, I've been to therapy for years and decades and it's all relationship, isn't, isn't it? Ah, and it's an interesting way to look at it because you see, you know, um, <laughs> most, most many, many, many therapists way would say they're relational therapists. And to be perfectly honest, the next question needs to be, what relationship are you talking about? Interesting. Are you talking about the relationship in the room between the therapist and client in 2023? Yeah. Are you talking about the relationship between the therapist and the younger self in 1984? No, what, what, what do you mean when you say relational therapists? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really important question. You see, if we go back in time, let's say, let's take 1950, and that's, what's that, 70 years ago? Or whatever. I was born in 1950, so this is 70 years ago. You know, and you went to bookshops, and if you could find any psychotherapy books um, or even psychoanalytical books or even therapy books about the new psychological um, therapies that were coming along, and certainly psychoanalysis, which was the flavor of the day from the beginning of the century, they would all talk about the importance of the, of the therapist or the analyst staying outside the relationship yeah it'd be completely opposite yeah now it's really important it would be completely opposite the early psychoanalysts believe that the therapist or the analyst was there to give interpretations and the only way they could have any neutral interpretations was stay outside the field of the you know of the uh analyst client picture in other words stay completely out in fact, to the extent they stood behind, well, the person was on a couch in the early days, weren't they? Yeah. And the person was behind them because they couldn't even see them. So it was all about staying out of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. If you went down, uh, I live in Manchester, if I went down into some psychotherapy shops in Manchester in 2023, most books, if not all books on psychotherapy, would be about how the therapist stays in the relationship and how the relationship is between the therapist and the client is the vehicle for cure. So there's been a dramatic shift in the last century. There are still therapy modalities where you don't take yourself into the therapy room so to speak you know you don't share personal experiences even if they're relevant and things it's uh, well that's now we're on to a different when you the second point the first point i agreed with you which is there are modalities exactly that you've just said which talk about the therapist you know not bringing their own history and self into the relationship you know that 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 is true definitely um but you see, since 1993, I would say, I was thinking when um, a lot of books started to talk about the importance of uh, the relationship as the major curative factor. Yeah. For cure, and it sort of the books started again, um, or the theory started to change as we hit the, hit the century we're in now. And there's many, 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 many books that all talk about um, relationship 
and that whole period since 99, mid 1990s is called the relational turn. So most therapy started to talk about the importance of relationship between the therapist and client, even if it's about how the therapist shares some of themself in the relationship. But it would be about using the relationship as the curative vehicle for cure. So then there's many, many, many books talking about counter-transference, talking about reactive counter-transference, talking about, you know, what the therapist should or shouldn't share, but it would all be about um, strengthening the relationship in the service of cure, not being totally outside the relationship. Yeah. So when people come to have a relational psychotherapist, they're talking about, or should be talking about, uh, the idea that the relationship is the major vehicle for cure. The relationship between the therapist and client. Yeah. Now, that's why I said right at the beginning, which is which relationship you're talking about. So, are you talking about the relationship in here and now, and therefore you're never going to deal with the relationship between the therapist and the younger self? You always just have an adult to adult relationship. It's yeah. certainly not my idea of therapy for me personally. I understand for many other people like CPT, for example, um, would be about staying in the present and many of the counselling folks as well. But I come from a developmental perspective, so I would be working with the younger self because that's where I think the real healing is. Yeah. So you've got a relationship between the therapist and the younger self then, haven't you? Yeah. Not a relationship between the therapist and the client, both at the appropriate ages. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's it's multidimensional as well, isn't it? It's like there's there's a heap load of relationships there. Yeah, so I always head in transaction analysis terms towards the child ego state. So yeah. I always think developmentally. Yeah. So I'm not in the game of past, you know, past timing or cures in an adult to adult relationships it's about healing the trauma thinking developmentally working the healing in the past so they can be different in the present that might lead to a robust adult relationship whether you're both appropriate the same age there but it, but it's not but the, you, you need to get there yeah so for yeah. me i think developmentally so Mostly, when I used to work, the relationship was with the younger self. That's the relationship I wanted to get to. Yeah. So, would you? I would call myself a developmental relational psychotherapist. When I stayed started off in 1985, I would simply call myself a transactional analyst. Yeah. Mid 90s, in the psychotherapy world in this country and 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 America, and sweeping into Europe was the idea of what, as I've just said, is the relationship is the curative factor. Where is it now? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, uh, I don't think you'd meet a therapist that would say that the relationship is really important on the road to cure with the client. Even <laughs> psychoanalysts, who believe in interpretation, free association, would also nowadays talk about relationship is a really important factor. They probably wouldn't go as far the next step and say that it was the exclusive factor for cure, but they would pay a lot more attention to it than they did 70 years ago. Yeah. It's just, you know, the, the way that therapy is, is delivered now has changed massively from, you know, even, I don't know, 10 years ago. You know, people have therapy via text now. I personally would find it really difficult to build a relationship with somebody over text. Yes, and also you've got the 
huge rise of online therapy, haven't you? Yeah. Huge rise of Zoom therapy. Yeah. Huge rise of... Um... At least with Zoom therapy. like It's like us now. We, we record these by Zoom. I can see your body language. I can hear the tone of your voice. I can... Yeah, I can get a lot more feeling for what's going on, even though we're not, you know, in person in the room. But via a text, it's so open to misinterpretation. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I don't like therapy by online medium. No. I don't like therapy by text or phone calls. Um, you know, I think uh, face-to-face therapy is... Uh, you know, more important. Having said all that lot, so I've said that, so yeah, that's my statement. Most therapy is about projections. In other words, you sit in front of somebody, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's by text, by other, and we project onto the screen our own history. Yeah. If you watch Love Island, for example, which is a reality television program, which I don't particularly care for much for lots of different reasons. Oh, let's pick another one. We watch The Traitors, which is another reality program. Um, or oh, whatever pose we want to watch. Or we watch X Factor, or we watch a, we could pick low Pollock or whatever we want to look, Oh no Street, anything you like. And we project onto the screen really our own history about what we've decided about other people in the world. Yeah, yeah. Who's good, who's bad, who's who's not, and whatever, yeah. And it reflects our own history. Yeah. So there is that part to think about it, that yeah. we live in the world of projections. Yeah. Relationships in general are very confusing when you think about it. They're, they're, they're confusing, and they really represent our past family and our past decisions about ourselves and the world so when you, when we talk about relational psychotherapy are you a relational psychotherapist like what we're talking this podcast then i can really understand the swing uh, uh, you know the beginning of the century or or from psychotherapy in general to the relationship what happens between the therapist and client is so important for cure in curative method, you know, curative factors. So if you have a therapist that doesn't engage, that stays, you know, way out of the relationship, yeah, that never shares anything about themselves, that stays as a, as an anonymized figure. I wouldn't call that relationship, relational psychotherapy in the way it's portrayed now in 2023. No, I can't imagine how that would work, to be honest, having been trained the way that I was. Well, you were trained relational. Yeah. In other words, you were trained in the relationship being an important vehicle for change. Yeah, absolutely. The first day, in the way you train, and a lot of TA therapists would train, and a lot of other therapists would train, is the first step is building up the relationship between the therapist and the client. Yeah. And if you're getting a robust relationship with the therapist and the client, and a trusting relationship, and a safe one, and a secure relationship between therapist and client, then therapy is more likely to happen. Yeah. And I, I say this so many times when people ask me about, you know, what modality of, of, you know, therapy is best. And yes, I'm, you know, I'm passionate about transactional analysis and I think it is the best one. But I always say it's more about it being a good fit. It's more about the relationship that you have with the other person in the room. The modality to me comes second to that. <clears throat> yeah. And me. And I do all the assessments, as you know, the Institute pass many members of the public um, onto therapists and I always say to them look my part of my job here is to match you up because therapy is always more effective yeah. if you actually have the f- same frame of reference or at least get on with the client yeah. I sort of get on with the therapist because then therapy is more likely 
I I believe be more effective because the relationship is more complete. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. And that is why the swing to you know relationship being the vehicle for cure has happened across many modalities over the last 20 years i mean you can sit there saying exactly what you just said is that you know it's important to have a a, a good fit and there's very few modalities i think now in 2023 that wouldn't recognize the curative fact of a of an effective relationship yeah yeah it has to be a two-way process in my head you know i don't know how how you can build empathy or feel empathy with another person unless there's a relationship there somehow that's right and it also demands something very challenging i think for the therapist um, because if they're going to be a true relational psychotherapist, it demands the challenge, which I think is quite cute for a lot of people who go into this business. They need to know themselves. Yeah. Now, that might be very challenging for people listening. But if you're going to promote relational psychotherapy as the major vehicle for effective cure, then you really need to know yourself because you're entering into a relationship uh, which can easily be contaminated by your own prejudices. Yeah, which we all have. Yeah, which relationship needs to be healthy. Yes, yeah. we all have them, but you see, if you're not, <laughs> if you haven't spent some time reflecting and having your own therapy, then you may not be aware of what you bring into a relationship. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. We all have them, yeah. but without being aware of them, we don't even give ourselves the chance to change or become, I'm going to say, more healthy on this for the service of the client. Yeah. We, we can contaminate the whole process by bringing in our own negative prejudices, if you yeah. want to put it that way. Yeah. Which again, yeah, they, I know we, we mention it a lot of the times, but it's one of the other things that I loved about transactional analysis is that for four years of training, you have four years of personal therapy. So at the end of it, you're very well aware of yourself. That's why I struggle with the BACP position. And that is the BACP position has now gone to a place you don't have to have any mm. reflection on yourself. To become a counsellor. I know this is about psychotherapy. I mean, that's the name of this podcast. But, you know, I struggle with that position. And I think that anybody in this field needs to be understanding their own contaminations, prejudices, because otherwise they'll easily bring it into the relationship. Mm -hmm. And that could easily end up in an unhealthy relationship, which that is difficult because that isn't going to be the vehicle for cure then, is it? No. Yeah. And it's, it, again, using your, you know, wonderful phrase, it is a process and it's a slow process at that. Well, certainly if you're going to be a developmental relational psychotherapist, the way I've just talked about it, which is seeing healing back where the trauma began, so you're going to have to head back then it is going to be a long process. If you're yeah. going to stay in the here and now, looking at behavioural focus solution issues, which some people may want to do, I don't want to start getting into denigrating that type of therapy, then it's it's a different type of therapy. Mm. I still think it would be good to have an effective relationship, though. Yeah, because yeah. Because I think that's going to be the vehicle for cure. Yeah. Yeah, there has to be some sort of a connection. I believe so. I think On it's a level of some, whether it is an adult to adult, but there has to be a relationship or a connection in some way. Yeah. See, the, the very first analysts going back 100 odd years ago now was built on 
a parent-child transactional dialogue. Mm. In other words, the analyst was the expert. Yeah. The analyst was the super parent, if you want to put it that way. The analyst was the person that would make the interpretations and have the monopolization on the truth. Yeah. So very parent-child led, which is why Eric Byrne developed transaction analysis in many ways. It wasn't the only reason, because he wanted to promote an adult to adult relationship to do the developmental work, if you like, but have a yeah, yeah. Um, a parent child transactional in a, in a dialogue, and it, which is totally different. Yeah, which when you started talking about this, I, that's something I wrote down was the okay corral that I'm okay, you're okay. Mm-hmm. Whereas I see the you know the good old fashioned couch scenario as you know the therapist is okay and the client isn't okay. They need fixing. They're broken, and you know the therapist is the one with all the answers. Yeah, and I don't think there was much good about that, even though you that, that was a quote or phrase of yours. <laughs> but I don't think there was much good about that. Now. For the seriously psychotic patients, maybe that's a different story. Yeah. But for the neurotic well, and for the sort of psychotherapy that we're talking about nowadays, it's far better to come from an adult adult place, even if you are going to head into the developmental world. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting when people call themselves relational therapists because um, I usually do ask, by the way, what do you mean by relationships therapists? Now, that flummoxed them because they aren't often asked that, but it's it's an interesting question back again. Yeah, absolutely. It's the same when people say they're integrated therapists. Which is what we're talking about next time, Bob, so don't talk too much about that. Okay, it's like, (laughs) well, what do you mean by that? Yeah. I'll leave to this podcast, but they're interesting questions. Yeah, absolutely. And questions that I do think it's good to to discuss because they are phrases that are bandied around an awful lot. And for the listeners, you know, to talk a little bit more in depth about what all these kind of mean and the different modalities that are out there. And even, you know, the like you were saying, the phases that psychotherapy goes through, going back from the 50s to the 70s to the 90s to where we are now, it's evolved. Yes, we were, you know, we're in a completely different arena in the mental in the service of mental health yeah and 150 years ago it's it is by definition um you know it's changed beyond all recognition i think the service of mental health um so that's certainly true and with it comes the evolution of psychotherapy and where that's just taken us yeah mm. very interesting so what we're going to be talking about next time bob <laughs> What's what that? do we mean by integrative psychotherapy? Oh, another one of my favourite subjects because, you know, Follows on. <laughs> I am an integrative psychotherapist. I call myself a developmental relational psychotherapist from an integrative transaction analysis position. That is a mouthful. That <laughs> absolutely, that, that's a hell of a tagline to have. Bob <laughs> Cook and then all that underneath it. <laughs> as well as being a human person. Yes, I yeah. agree. Yeah. <laughs> so until next funny. time, Bob. <laughs> thank you so much. No, thank you, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode. <laughs>